Hello guys, welcome to chapter one of the podcast, the second podcast, and we got some good early World War Two. Okay, so chapter one, 800 Heroes, the Battle of Saiheng Warehouse, Shanghai, Republic of China, October 26th, November 1st, 1937. The constant crack of rifle fire and the rumbling of armored cars echoed through the black smoke hanging in the night air. Shanghai, the fifth largest city in the world, was burning. It had once been known as the Queen of the Orient, a glitzy metropolis of high fashion, luxurious nightlife, bustling harbors, and towering side skyscrapers. It was now rapidly being reduced to a mixture of bloody hand-dug trenches, empty bullet casings, and coiled tangles of barbed wire. The city of Shanghai had been home to three and a half million civilians. Now it was the front line of what would become the biggest and most destructive war in human history. Amid the chaos and epic horribleness, Colonel Xi Jinyuan of the Chinese Nationalist Army calmly walked the imposing headquarters of his shattered division, the steel and concrete rectangular building known as the Saihang Warehouse, was one of the few surviving structures amid the rubble of northern Shanghai. It was sturdy and secure, backed against the Shuzhou River, and would be the perfect defensive position. Exhausted from three months of non-stop combat against a determined, unrelenting enemy. Xi Jinyuan decided that he and the surviving members of his command would make their last stand here. A lot of uptight, pipe-smoking historians like to go on and on about how World War II started with Adolf Hitler's invasion of Poland in 1939, mostly because they don't think it's cool to pay attention to any history that didn't happen in Europe or in the United States. In reality, the first shots of World War II were fired in 1937, when the swiftly growing Empire of Japan decided to flex its bulging muscles by conquering everything around it. Fueled by its people's fanatical devotion to their emperor, their unequaled ferocity in battle, and some of the most advanced military technology this side of a science fiction movie, Japan defeated Russia in a war in 1905, then Korea in 1910, and captured the province of Manchuria from China in 1932. In 1937, the Japanese war machine surged forward once again, this time with a full-scale attack into the heart of China itself. The Chinese were in the middle of a civil war at that time, making it really inconsiderate of the Japanese to start bombing them while they were busy trying to kill each other. The uncoordinated, unprepared fight frontline armies of China were churned into mulch and lost their capital city, Beijing, to the, cap- to the Japanese pretty much immediately. By October, what remained of the Chinese military was falling back toward the Yangtze River and the important port city of Zhengha. With more than a hundred thousand elite Japanese troops storming toward them, the Chinese prepared to dig in and defend their city at all costs. They had way more fighters than the Japanese, but they were not nearly as well trained or as well equipped. Shanghai quickly became a war zone, with defenders digging five foot deep trenches in the middle of streets, while Japanese bombers reduced skyscrapers to smoking ruins. Homes were flattened, factories were gutted, and the biggest battle to grip Asia in over a century swept the economic heartland of China with fire and bullets. By the time Xi Jinwan moved his troops into the Shanghai Saihang warehouse on October 26, 1937, it was pretty much all over. The Chinese had fought bravely, but they were outmatched in every way. A few days earlier, a flotilla of Japanese warships had pulled into the harbor, rained gunfire on the city, and then deployed hardcore Japanese marines right behind the main lines of the Chinese troops 
all but cutting off their escape route. The command came down for the Chinese army to retreat from the city and evacuate as many civilians as possible in the process. The specific orders given to Colonel C were simple: hold the warehouse until someone kills you. By the civilians and soldiers of Shanghai, time to get the heck out of there before the German—I mean, before the Japanese—level the city into a giant pile of smoking misery. Make the invaders pay for every step. Saihang Warehouse was the perfect spot to defend, standing out like a beacon amid the destruction of the Battle of Shanghai. The six the six story warehouse was made of bulletproof concrete and had plenty of good spots for sniper rifle hide and seek. Better yet, it was positioned to cross a narrow river from a part of Shanghai known as the International Settlement. Neighborhood that was home to British, French, and American embassies and citizens. The Japanese couldn't bomb the warehouse to cinder box with artillery and airplanes, as if just one little bomb missed its target and accidentally landed on some British guy's house. The Japanese would have an un-、uh, would have an ugly international incident on their hands. They were gonna have to take this warehouse the old-fashioned way if they wanted to get rid of C and his battalion. Thirty-two-year-old Colonel C. Jinyuan was a graduate of China's Wampoa Military Academy, later named the Central Military Academy, and the men of his battalion were some of the best troops the Chinese military had to offer. Knitted out with top-of-the-line German helmets, rifles, and other gear, these guys had been trained by General Alexander von Falkenhausen, an awesome-looking old German military commander who had fought against the British in World War One and had earned his country's highest award for military bravery. C knew he was outnumbered and outgunned and had no hope of reinforcement, resupply, or survival. But he didn't even flinch. He went right to work, preparing to give the Japanese the fight of their lives. He ordered his men to clear out the areas around the warehouse so they could have open lines of fire. He looted surrounding warehouses for and shops for food, ammo, and medical supplies. He rigged nearby buildings with explosives so he could blow them up if the Japanese tried to set up snipers or machine guns inside them. He had his men cut holes in ten-foot-thick walls of the warehouse so they could shoot through them while staying behind cover. Sure, this was an unwinnable battle, but Xi Jinping and his soldiers were determined to show the world that China wasn't going down without a fight. The Japanese arrived on the morning of October twenty-seventh. The attack began at dawn. The job of kicking down the warehouse fell to the soldiers of Japan's elite third division, who rolled up with mortars, potato gun-looking tubes used to launch bombs at short distances, machine guns, and armored cars. As the men of the third division approached the warehouse, they were greeted by a high five of Chinese bullets all up in their grills. Colonel C's troops were battle-hardened warriors, and they had spent the past three months defending a train station in the northern part of town. The battalion had been reduced their forces from eight hundred to four hundred and fourteen, but the soldiers who remained were excellent marksmen and weren't about to freak out when just because the Japanese were raking their warehouse with a non-stop stream of machine gun bullets and other deadly objects. The battle lasted most of the day. The Japanese attacking many times. Colonel C ran up and down, screaming for his men to hold the line. At one point, he even had to run downstairs with a bucket of water and a rifle because a couple of Japanese dudes broke into the warehouse and tried to set a fire in the room where C kept some of his bullets and fuel, which would have been a pretty bad idea for him. The Japanese attack halted that night, and C used a break to have his men rebuild their defenses and move their guns to different hiding spots. He even snuck a couple of his wounded men across the bridge to the British side so they could get medical attention. The next morning, C looked out the window and saw an interesting sight. All along the British side of the river were people standing and watching the fight. 
British soldiers, international journalists, and even Chinese residents of Shanghai, who had escaped to safety in the international settlement, were lined up to watch and cheer on the brave defenders of Sai Heng Warehouse. One of the people lining the banks of the river was a girl named Yang Huiming. She watched in awe as the defenders spent yet another day fighting off non-stop attacks from the Japanese, shooting apart attempts to storm the building and raining down grenades and mortar fire on the Japanese tanks that tried to roll up on the structure. For Yang, only one thing was missing: the Chinese defenders didn't have a flag over their building. So that night. When the fighting stopped, she wrapped a Chinese nationalist flag around herself, swam across the Suzhou River, and snuck into the building. By the next morning, Yang had already escaped back to the British side of the river, and the Japanese ro- woke up to a giant Chinese flag staring them in the face. This made them even crankier. For an incredible four days, the brave warriors of Sai Heng Warehouse. Held up against pretty much everything the Japanese Third Division had to offer, the 414 men, known to the international press as the 800 Heroes, because C lied about how many guys he had with him, fought day and night with no break from the constant Japanese onslaught. When the Japanese turned off the buildings running water, the Chinese collected their pee in big gross buckets and used that to put out fires. When the Japanese put mortars and machine guns on opposing roofs, C blew them up with accurate mortar fire. When the Japanese drove tanks up to attack them with hand grenades, when enemy teams broke into the lower floors of the structure, Chinese troops met them head on with bayonets and face punches until the Japanese got out. For seventy-two seeming endless hours. The eight hundred heroes struggled for their lives, firing so many bullets that the barrels of their guns turned orange from the heat. C had been ordered to defend to the death, but on November first, his commander told him to go. The city was evacuated, and the mission was complete. So, in the very late hours of the next day, C and his men made their way to the river. Leaving behind a few badly wounded soldiers to lay down cover and fire with heavy machine guns, C and his three hundred and seventy-six survivors of the battle reached the British side, where they would end up being confined for the next three years. For the heroes of World War, for the first heroes of World War Two, the war was over before it had really gotten started. The eight hundred heroes became superstars overnight. Despite the defeat in Shanghai and the destruction of the main Chinese military, the tale of Colonel Shi and his brave men inspired the Chinese people to carry on the battle and resist the Japanese takeover in any way they could. Nazis in the Himalayas. On a weird note, the Japanese invasion of China annoyingly messed up Nazi plans to travel to Tibet in search of a secret race of white-skinned supermen. Yes, you read that correctly. In 1937, a world-renowned German adventurer and zoologist named Ernst Schaffer left Berlin to explore Tibet and document its wildlife ecology and botany. But many folks aren't quite sure that's the whole reason he was traveling there. Schaffer was a pretty light, was a pretty legit scientist, but most of the money for his trip was put up by Heinrich Himmler. The head of a super nefarious Nazi organization known as the SS. Find more about this here. Himmler not only saw this mission as an opportunity to put photos of heroic-looking mountain-climbing Nazis on the front page of the news, but also is believed to have ordered Schaffer to search for anything from Indiana Jones-style magical devices to hidden races of white guys who had lived in the Himalayas for centuries. The British were pretty sure he was just scouting out the best trails to use to attack India from China, so he tried to block him from entering Tibet. But the enterprising German went around the Japan-China War, snuck past the Brits, and spent fourteen months climbing the Himalayas, gathering data and talking to the locals. Schaffer returned with journals packed full of notes on everything from Buddhist rituals to Himalayan wasps. Ecology. 
but he never mentioned anything about world destroying ancient artifacts or abominable snowmen. A fall of Nanjing. After the fall of Shanghai, the Japanese pushed farther south to Nanjing, which at the time was the capital of the Chinese nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek. The Japanese were not kind to the city. They killed everyone they found and looted and destroyed everything they could. Current estimates suggest that 300,000 innocent civilians were butchered in a truly horrifying display that causes trouble between the two countries to this day. Amid the carnage and misery, one man, a prominent Nazi party member named John Rabe, used whatever powers he could to shelter people from the destruction. Rabe is credited with protecting as many as 200,000 people from the Japanese brutality in Nanjing. Putting the civil war in pause, China was ruled by emperors for more than 3,000 years, but when the last emperor of the Qing dynasty was overthrown in 1911, there was a big nasty debate over how the country should be run. This eventually blew up into the 1927 Chinese Civil War, during which a pro-democracy military dictator named Chiang Kai-shek fought against communist forces under Chairman Mao Zedong. When Japan rolled tanks and warplanes into town, the two Chinese leaders agreed to stop shooting each other until they defeated the Japanese. And for most part, both sides held up their end of the deal. But after Japan was finally thrown up in 1945, the two dictators picked right where they left off. Mao Zedong won the war and set up the Communist People's Republic of China on October 1st, 1949. Chiang and his troops fled to the island of Taiwan, and the government they established there holds power to this day. Needless to say, China and Taiwan still pretty much mega hate each other. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. And I'll see you later. Bye bye.